good morning, everybody, and Happy New Year. I'm looking forward this afternoon to going to Fitzpatrick's and watching football and getting a free lunch. Just text me your address. I'm not sure where I'm going. Hey, we're starting a new series, and I want to begin with reading the first two pages of Max Lucado's book titled A Heart Like His. He writes, What if, for one day, Jesus were to become you? What if, for 24 hours, Jesus wakes up in your bed, walks in your shoes, lives in your house, assumes your schedule? Your boss becomes his boss. Your mother becomes his mother. Your pains become his pains. With one exception, nothing about your life changes. Your health doesn't change. Your circumstances don't change. Your schedule isn't altered. Your problems aren't solved. Only one change occurs. What if, for one day and one night, Jesus lives your life with his heart? Your heart gets the day off. And your life is led by the heart of Christ. His priorities govern your actions. His passions drive your decisions. His love directs your behavior. What would you be like? Would people notice a change? Your family, would they see something new? Your coworkers, would they sense a difference? What about the less fortunate? Would you treat them the same? And your friends, would they detect more joy? And your enemies, would they receive more mercy from Christ's heart than from yours? And you, how would you feel? What alterations would this transplant here on your stress level? What about your mood swings, your temper? Would you sleep better? Would you see sunsets differently, death differently, taxes differently? Any chance you'd need fewer aspirin or sedatives? How about your reaction to traffic delays? Ouch, that touched a nerve. Would you still dread what you are dreading? Better yet, would you still do what you are doing? Would you still do what you had planned to do for the next 24 hours? Pause and think about your schedule. Obligations, engagements, outings, appointments. With Jesus taking over your heart, would anything change? So if Jesus took over your heart right now, would anything change? And that's why we're beginning this new series, LLLJ, Learning to Love Like Jesus. We want to learn. We all have, especially me, so much to learn about loving like Jesus. And so at the end of this series, which will extend to the end of June, we'll have a couple of breaks in March and April, but mostly we'll focus on the Gospels and looking at the love and the compassion and the integrity of Jesus. So what about you? How are you loving? This month, we're going to focus on compassion. And my favorite passage in all the New Testament on compassion, we're going to look at that right now. So if you have a Bible, turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 9. If you don't have a Bible, turn on your phone. If you don't have a phone or a Bible, just look up the screen. Would you stand with me and just read Matthew, chapter 9, verses 35 to 38. Matthew 9, 35 to 38. Four short verses. And Matthew writes, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. All right, let's pray. So, Lord, right now we come to you, and we ask that you would speak to us, that we would examine our hearts, and, Lord, we may not change much today, but I pray that you would touch us today, and that come July 1st, we can see a difference, not only in ourselves, but in our church. In Christ's name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Okay, four things, four simple principles, truths come out of this passage. Four things that Jesus does. First is that Jesus goes. Jesus goes. He begins with saying Jesus went. This means Jesus took the initiative. 
This means that Jesus didn't wait for someone else to take the lead. He got going. So if you have your own Bible here, how many have your own Bible here? Okay, you're allowed to bring your own Bible. All right. If you don't have your own Bible, you can take one from the church, which Ron has. Uh, if you do that, you're going to have to pay us. But anyway, <laughs> not to use it, but I'm going to ask you to write in it right now. So I want you to take your Bible, and uh, everyone needs to bring a pen, a pencil, crayon to church. Remember that. I want you to underline the words Jesus went. So go ahead, underline. If you got a Bible and a pen, underline Jesus went. Okay? you got to do that. Trust me. This is good for you. Then I want you to... Make it bold. Thicken it up a little bit. Put it in bold. Jesus went. Okay? See how I did that on the screen? Jesus went. Now I want you to make it bigger. I want you to make it like 40 font or something like that. I want you to make Jesus went bigger in your Bible. God wants you to write in your Bible. I want you to know that. Jesus went. Make it bigger. And now I want you to get out your yellow highlighter, which you bring to church with you. And I want you to highlight Jesus went. Don't you love my mad, crazy computer skills there? So you want to highlight that. You see, because see, what I'm trying to say is this is the two most important words in the whole text. We totally miss it, but it all begins with these two words, Jesus went. He didn't procrastinate. Most New Testament scholars say Jesus' public ministry, which was began when he was baptized by John the Baptist, lasted up to three and one half years. He did so much in three and one half years, which means chances are as if God is prompting you to reach out to somebody today, he's not saying, get going in two years. No, no. It's the month of January. We're already six days in. It's going so fast. It's almost over. You got 25 days left. In 25 days, you ought to start reaching out to this person. If you wait to February, you're going to forget about it. You're never going to get around to it. You're going to say, well, I felt led at one time in my life to do something. What did you do about it? There's no point in being led if you don't actually do something about when you're led. Okay. So God wants to get going. Jesus got a lot done in three and a half years, didn't he? He changed the whole course of the world in three and a half years. So let's uh, find out how old everybody is here today, okay? <laughs> Raise your hand up high if you are under the age of 25. That's not me, but go ahead. That's what you do. No, no liars, no middle-aged people raising their hands. We had people like that a lot. All right, you're under the age of 25. All right, all right here I'm going to tell you right now. I want you to plan your life as if you have 60 years more to live. Isn't that good news? No. But live it as if you only have four years left. You got 60 years. Plan out till you're 85 or 80, wherever you're at. But I want you to live it as if you got four years left. Okay, who's between the ages of 25 and 40? Raise your hand. Okay. I want you to plan out your life as if you have 50 years left to live, but live it as if you only have four years left. Who's in the 40s? Raise your hand in the 40s. All right. I want you to plan as if you have 40 more years left. You're halfway through there. And, but live it as if you only have four left. Who's in their 50s? All right, okay. On the downside. Anyway, plan out your life as if you have 30 more years left. You got 30 years left. You got a lot of time left. Live it as if you have four left. Who's in their 60s? Okay, you're two-thirds of the way through. Plan out your life as if you have 20 years left, but live as if you have four left. Who's in their 70s? Okay, bummer. Anyway, plan out your life <laughs> as if you have 10 years left, <laughs> but live it as if you have four left. Who's in their 80s? Well, you're lucky to be alive. Anyway, <laughs> Charlie, plan out your life as if you've got five years left. Live it as if you have one to two years left. Anybody in their 90s here? Oh, wow. Oh, let's give a big round of applause. We get somebody here in their 90s. We want you to mentor everyone else in this room. You might not have four more years. Moses says, Lord, teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. You may say, I want to go on a missions trip, and you may never get on one because you waited three years, and by then you weren't around anymore. You see, you've only got so much time to make a difference in this world, and so Jesus went. Jesus didn't sit and do nothing. He went. 
And he had a universal love. Notice, Jesus went through all the towns and villages. One scholar said there were maybe up to 240 towns and villages in Galilee. Jesus went through all the towns and villages. Jesus started in the synagogues. He reached out to the Jewish people, went to the synagogues. But of course, his home base was in Capernaum, and that was a mixed population of Jews and Gentiles. So Jesus reached out to all peoples. If Jesus were begin his ministry here today, who would he reach out to? Would he just reach out to native Marylanders? Do we have any native Marylanders in here? Okay, excellent. Any native Frederick Calliers? Okay, okay, we've got a few hicks. Anyway, so, um, <laughs> no, I <laughs> slip. Sorry, I didn't mean that. I thought it was in Iowa. Anyway, um, let's move on. Um, who would he reach out to? Everybody. Hicks. <laughs> Educated Hicks. He'd reach out to Gentile and Jew. Black, white, brown, red, yellow. He'd reach out people to people who were churched and people who were unchurched. People with conservative theology, people with not so conservative theology. People who are American citizens, people who are not yet American citizens. People who are documented, people who are undocumented. People who are legal, people who are here illegally. Jesus would reach out to every single person on this planet, and he'd reach out probably to the person that you thought, I can't believe he's doing that, because you will not That's what the disciples said. Oh, Jesus, what are you doing? Because every good Jew, when they traveled north from Jerusalem to Galilee, went to the border of Samaria and Judea, and then they would go right, go a few miles east, go on the other side of the Jordan River, go up, and then cross over and avoid Samaria. But Jesus is like, that's too long. I don't have that much time. He went right through Samaria, came to Jacob's well. Right there is the Samaritan woman who had been married five times, working her sixth. She's a woman. She's had on six marriages. She's a Samaritan. She is a product of people who are half-breeds. They've been intermarried with the Assyrians. They follow the five books of Moses, but not. They've rejected the rest of the Old Testament. So a good Jew says those people are not. They worship at the wrong. They don't even worship in Jerusalem. They worship under some dumb mountain. They don't really count. And Jesus is like, but I'm going to reach out to her. And so she and him talk. And he says, would you give me something to drink? And it leads her a few minutes later to drop in her pitcher run into town, hey, come here. I think I've met the Messiah. The whole town believed in Jesus because he reached out to someone who was off limits to the Jews. Where would he go? Probably wouldn't have an office, would he? Where would he go? McDonald's, absolutely. I guarantee you he'd be in McDonald's. Maybe Starbucks, definitely not the drive through You can't talk to too many people at the drive through Maybe once in a while, you know. Wouldn't it be awesome to be serving Jesus at the drive through you know, and you hand him a cup of coffee, and the next thing you're repenting, you know. <laughs> the ball field, he'd be at Baker Park, wouldn't he? He'd just be hanging out at Baker Park. He'd, he'd pick up some ball that somebody that came his way returned it. Next thing you know, she's having a kind. Next thing everybody's showing up, he's healing everybody at Baker Park. He's holding a revival at Baker Park. Um, would he go to the bar? No doubt. No doubt. He'd go to the bar. I don't know what he'd order. He'd meet somebody like named Matthew, strike up a conversation. Matthew would be converted in the bar next weekend. Matthew invites all of his cronies over. He throws a party for Jesus, and Jesus is at Matthew's house and have this huge party. Next thing you know, Matthew's studying to be a pastor, right? That's what Jesus does. He went into all the villages and the towns because he went and what does he do? It says he did three things. He taught in their synagogues, he proclaimed the good news, and he healed every disease and sickness. We see the twofold ministry of Jesus, the ministry of word and the ministry of deed, teaching and proclaiming 
and healing. You have to have both. In every great mission, you have to have the ministry of word and you have to have the ministry of deed. The two go in like hand and glove. There's a time, Ecclesiastes says, there's a time for everything under heaven. And Ecclesiastes 3.7 says, there's a time to be silent. There's a time when you, you have to be silent. Like if you have someone move into your neighborhood the first day and you decide, I'm going to be friendly, you go knock on their door. You don't go knock on them and say, hey, did you know that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God? And the wages of sin is death. Oh, that's a bad opening line to your neighbor. I want you to know that. No, no, no. Just be a friend. Try to be normal for once in your life. Just go and say, hey, how are you doing? My name is Guy. If you need your lawn mowed, I'm your man for free. Whatever. Just be a friend. But then there's going to be a time you're going to have to go to lunch or invite them over to your house or maybe you invite them to church on Christmas Eve or what. however you get into it, there comes a time to speak, right? Timing is everything, right? The principle of timing. Jesus would go everywhere. He would engage in the ministry of word and deed. If you've read the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and if you're in our program called 26, this week we'll be reading Matthew 5 to 10. If you re- watch, at the end of chapter 4, Matthew 4, it says, everyone has come to his house, has come to his where he's at because he's healing everybody, because he's doing all this great stuff. People are just flocking to him. And then it says, he got in a boat, he sat down, he taught the multitudes. Because he had done so much good works, he now had a platform to teach his word. So, those of you guys with a pen or a pencil, I want you to write down these 13 words, okay? It's only 13 words, but you got to write these down or memorize them, okay? Here they are. We do good works to create goodwill to share the good news. Right, let me say it again. We do good works to create goodwill to share the good news. We do good works to create goodwill, to share the good news. It's all about sharing the good news, but you know what? More often than not, you're going to have to do good works to create goodwill to share the good news. You got that? And that's what Jesus did. But remember the two key words? Jesus what? Went. Okay, so um, now next Sunday afternoon, Steve, I'm doing a plug for you right now. Okay? Because I'm... January 13th, 5 to 6 p.m. is the orientation introduction to missions trips for our youth, okay? Oh, there it is. Okay, I got it. I thought I lost it. Impact trips. Here's our great brochure. I designed this brochure, by the way. No, I didn't. I'm just joking. I did not design it. In here, it tells you all the trips. So, first, for high school, we have a tr- two different weeks of going to Columbia, not Columbia, Maryland, but Columbia, what country is that in? Where is that at? South America, America, somewhere down there. It's hot down there, all right? But it's not as hot as Maryland in July, trust me. So remember that. Two different weeks to Columbia. Middle scores go to Pittsburgh, all right? Graduating seniors in college age, Greece, July 7 to 17, okay? College age and up, you can go to South Africa and to July, or you can go to Jordan. We got a missions trip going to Jordan. If you're 21 and over, which a lot of us are, um, Bangladesh in September for 10 days. Family trips, North Carolina, Florida, Texas, those dates are to be determined. March, we got like one or two trips to Honduras. And then adults only, you got to be an adult, okay? What age does that mean, though, adults? <laughs> what is so dumb? Anyway, East Asia in late February and March. But there's so many opportunities to go on mission. Teenagers, those two weeks in July, don't go any, don't go, if you're, if you're too busy to go, no, don't, I mean, stop whatever you were going to do. Go to Columbia. Go to Pittsburgh. Go on mission. Your life will change. Jesus went. So should you. Now, last year, I went on two different trips. Uh, Lori and I went to Israel, the sort of a mission trip, sort of not, Israel, Jordan, and Egypt. And then I went to Cape Town, South Africa for 10 days. I was gone a lot last year, so I got I to gotta be good this year. I got to stay home. 
I got to take out the trash, you know, I got to be a good husband and father and pastor and lay a little bit low. But next year, I'm going to go on another trip. So I was like, where should I go next year? I was like, so I'm praying about thinking about it. I was like, you know what? I keep seeing the words Hawaii. I'm just <laughs> popping my head. Hawaii. And I was thinking, why, why is the Lord, you know, prompting me, putting Hawaii in my heart? And, you know, I watch that TV show every Friday night, Hawaii Five-0. I've been watching it for seven years. You guys ever watch that? I've seen every episode. There is so much crime in Hawaii. I'm like, we need to go and have a mission there and tell them about Jesus. And I'm thinking, maybe more than a week. I'm thinking, this is probably to really do something significant, maybe a month, four to six weeks. So Hawaii, probably next February, is thinking about Hawaii. Um, just kidding. You know what, if you can't go on a missions trip, you can just walk across the street, right? You actually just say, how you doing? All right, you can try to be a friend. You get to know somebody, right? That's mission. It's not intercultural, cross-cultural mission, but you know what, the world's come to America. There's so many people from other nations that are living next door to you. Just be a friend and engage, and it might lead to a conversation. Jesus goes, second Jesus sees. Matthew 9, 36. Teaching, proclaiming the good news, healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, when he saw the crowds, Jesus sees. So Jesus isn't nearsighted. He's not farsighted. He doesn't need eyeglasses. But when he sees the crowds, now this service is probably the most full service we've had of the three. But I can still, you know, there are some people you guys help me out. I know where you, some of you guys sit in the same, some of you confuse me. You've moved a little bit, right? But Mark, you guys are always right there, you know. I can see where people are and you guys are right there all the time. And, but you know, Jesus, when he looks around, he really sees, doesn't he? And he's got the, like, Superman x-ray vision, you know, and, and he sees your head and your face and your shoulders and your heart and your countenance, and he already knows what your biggest need is, doesn't he? He sees the crowd. You know, you guys ever watch Sherlock Holmes? There's the new Sherlock put out by BBC about 10 years ago. It's a contemporary Sherlock Holmes. If you haven't seen it, you've got to see it. It's great. But in the very first episode, Sherlock Holmes, you know, meets Dr. John Watson, his partner. Well, they haven't even met yet. I think somehow Sherlock has seen him somewhere. But uh, so Sherlock, you know, he's high tech. He sends Dr. Watson a text message and says, would you want to move into the flat with me? And Watson writes him back like, why would I want to do that? First, I don't know who you are. You know nothing about me, and we've never even met. So, he, so Sherlock texts him, sends him a text back and says, well, what do you mean? I know that you're an army doctor. I know that you've been invalided back home from the war in Afghanistan. I know that your brother wants to reach out to you. But because your brother is likely an alcoholic, you don't want to help him. And plus, I think it's because he's recently left his wife, and that's why you don't want to help you out. And by the way, your therapist thinks your limp is psychosomatic. And I think she's correct. It's right. It is psychosomatic. So meet me this afternoon at 221B Baker Street at 3 p.m. And he shows up. <laughs> How does Sherlock know all that? Because he sees and he observes he looks at your fingernails. He can tell whether you're a lumberjack or whether you're a typist. He looks at your face. can tell whether you've had three marriages or one. He, he's observant. And God's sort of like that. He sees. And that's what we have to be. We have to be observant enough to look at people and see something's not good. Something's wrong there. Somebody's hurting, Right? And that's what we need to do. Third, when we see, we feel. It says Jesus feels. It says that when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He had compassion. So this month we're focusing on compassion. The amazing characteristic of Jesus is his compassion. You may remember when he said to the rich young ruler, 
And rich young ruler is like, I've done all this. And Jesus says, the one thing you lack is you, you, know, you, need, you love your wealth, so sell all you have and give to the poor. And it says Jesus looked at him and he loved him. It was all over Jesus' face. He just loved this guy. See, but if you don't go, you're not going to see. And if you don't see, you're never going to feel. You've got to go. It begins with Jesus went. And then you see and then you feel. In Luke 7, Jesus is, on, on a, is going. He's got a crowd following him. Here it says in Luke chapter 7 that he goes to this town called Nain. His disciples are there. There's a large crowd with him, maybe 500 people. Then there's a funeral possession coming out of Nain. And there's a large crowd with him. And a dead person's being carried out. It's the only son of his mother. And she's a widow. Strike number one. Your husband's dead. Probably your fault in that society. Secondly, now she's lost her son. Her son has died. So now she has no child. She's a woman. She's got no money. She's got no husband. She's got no child. Everybody thinks what? If you were a good Jew, God would have answered your prayers. Your kid wouldn't have died, right? So you're not a good Jew. So she's already now shamed, and she's got nothing. And Jesus looked at her, and what's it say? When he saw her, his heart went out to her. That's what makes Jesus Jesus, isn't it? Not because he can just, you know, you know, woof and, you know, press the magic button and you're healed. It's because his heart went out to people. See, here's my question for you. When was the last time you cried? When was the last time you cried, not over yourself, <laughs> which is okay once in a while. When was the last time you looked at somebody and you entered into their pain and you broke down. If it never happened in 2018, will it in 2019? If it doesn't, something is missing. Something's missing. You're too far away. See, when we're so far away from people, we don't really see the real need. So I'm going to give you all a homework assignment. You're not going to want to do this, okay? But I'm going to give you a homework assignment this afternoon. I want you to go home, stand in front of the biggest mirror in your house, get about 15 feet away from the mirror, because now it looks pretty good, right? <laughs> Hopefully. And then you to get 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, Three, two, one, five inches. You look in the mirror and you're like, <gasps> you notice those nose hairs sticking out of your nose. You got hair growing in your ears. You're like, oh my goodness. You see all those wrinkles that you didn't see before. And then you're like, there's a piece of broccoli in my teeth. Did the people notice in church I had food in my mouth? And you see up close the real you. And you're like, oh, my goodness. And it hurts. Because <laughs> you got close. You got a close look. See, we don't care about people because we don't get a close enough look. We're so busy watching TV at home and living in a different kind of world to walk across the room and get on a street corner and take someone to breakfast and have a conversation and pause and enter into their world and go on mission, right? So if we're removed from people... Another reason we might never have emotion is we're removed from God. So that's why we started this program 26. If you want to be part of it, you still can. And the bulletin says how you can sign up. Go to our website. But three things you need. If you want to feel, if you want to go, see, and feel, you're going to need three things. One, time with God. One, you're going to need a time and place. Number one, you need a time and place. It doesn't have to be the same time and place every day, but you need a time and place because it's not going to happen if you don't plan for it. Second, you need an open Bible, even just one chapter a day. Focus closely on that one chapter. And then you need an open heart. Three things you need. If you are not ever setting aside any time and place, 
and never have an open Bible without an open heart, you aren't going to feel the way God wants you to feel about him or people. If you do, that devotion will change your heart. The condition of mankind, Jesus says, he felt compassion for them for they were like sheep without a shepherd. Um, That just means people are aimless. It means people need a leader, but they don't have one. It's why people do what they do. It's why people give their day to drinking and drugs and sleeping around and cutting themselves and being obsessed with perfection, or even while they're sinning, like they're bullying people, or they've got anger, or they're engaged in crime, or they have an addiction, or you have to be popular. All those things are symptoms that in my own heart is not filled with the love of God. And we all have those in some way, shape, or form, because we're all sinners. We all are on a journey. We're all on pro- in process. But we can be found, and we can know that someone loves us just the way we are, which is what every one of us needs. At Mountain View Community Church, we don't want a church for ourselves. We want a church for others. That's what we want. Because some people are lost, and they can't find their way home. I've got a picture of a lady. Her name was... Geraldine Largay. At age 66, she and her best friend decided to hike the Appalachian Trail. In March of 2013, they started out right down here in Harper's Ferry. And three months in on their way to Maine, her friend had a family emergency, and so she decided no longer to hike, and Geraldine decided to continue on all the way to Maine. Geraldine's weakness, as her friend said, was she was not very good with directions. Well, one day, she just got off the trail. You know, you get off that trail at certain parts of the trail just a little bit. It's hard to find your way back. She sent her first text to her husband. I'm lost. Please call the police and help. But he couldn't get that text. She had no reception. She kept a journal for one more month. They found her two years later, two miles off the trail, And they know exactly what she was going through because it was all recorded in her journal. She just couldn't find her way back. And that's the way people are in this world. There are people that have gotten off the trail and they just can't find their way back because they're lost. And the good news is that we can help find them. We exist for the reason of going out and rescuing those that are lost pointing them to Jesus and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and I am the resurrection, the life, and pointing them to Jesus Christ who can fill that hungry heart, the hole in our lives. And you and I need to be on mission together as a church, whether we go to Greece or South Africa or Brunswick or next door or wherever it is, we must together go as Jesus went, see as Jesus saw, feel as Jesus felt. And the last thing Jesus says He asks us to do one thing in Matthew 9, 37 to 38. He closes by saying this. He says, Then he says to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send workers out into his harvest field. Do you know what that means? He's asking you and I to pray that God would raise up more workers to go out in his harvest field. So, It's January 6th. Is that what day it is? Yeah. So for 25 days, would you spend 25 seconds before you go to bed? Just get on your knees and say, Lord, the harvest is plentiful. There's people all out there. There's people out there right now that act like they're Mr. Cool and they don't need Jesus, but they're really Mr. You know, needy, right? They just don't want anybody to know it. Lord, raise up more workers to go out in the harvest field. If you do that for 25 days straight, you know what God's going to say to you? What about you? Maybe you should be the answer to your prayers. Maybe God's raising up you 
to go out into his harvest field and tell her, that's how it worked with me. It was 1981, which was a long time ago when I was 20 years old. I went to Wyoming on this trip with Youth for Christ. I'd been a Christian six weeks, and there's a pastor named Don Landis that preached in the morning and taught at night, and then we went rock climbing, did all that cool stuff during the day. And he said to me one day, Guy, we need more workers. And I was like, okay, I'll think about that. And that's why I do what I do, because we need more workers. We need you guys. You don't have to be pastors or missionaries. You can be doctors and lawyers and accountants and nurses. But whatever, wherever you are, we need you in the harvest field. As the worship team comes up, I want to just share about my week last week with you guys, because I shared a little bit about it with you. Uh, as many of you know, if you were here last week, my cousin Mark passed away. His name, he was 57. He died on Christmas Day. I got a phone call the day after Christmas from my mom. His, his dad, my uncle, called and said Mark had died, and he had, he had health issues. So then Sunday, I drove up to my mom in Allentown, about three hours away, I went to this funeral the next morning. Uh, Mark was unchurched. Um, I wish I had talked to him more about Christ. He was unchurched. Uh, didn't have a pastor. Services in a funeral home. Uh, his father, who was, has started to go back to church, the pastor for his father did the service. But he didn't know Mark. I don't even know if he really met Mark. Um, he did a fine job. I would never criticize any pastor who officiates a funeral of someone they've never met. And yet, after it was over, and we had a luncheon, and I spent about two hours with my family, about 15 or 20 of us. I went to my aunt, Mark's mom, and said, you know, it was a nice service. And she said, I just really wish the pastor knew him. See, all the pastor did was read scripture and give like a sermon, you know? You know what I mean? Like a non-relational sermon, just a sermon. There was no eulogy. There was no open sharing. She, she just wanted people. She wanted to hear, I think, people who knew him, that he, they loved him, right? Everyone wants to know they're loved. And that's the good news for us today is that God loves you. And Jesus died for you. And that's the message we have to tell the world. And after I was talking to my aunt, I drove home. My mom couldn't make it because she's got some health problems. I told my mom what my aunt said. She's like, she said a few things. I was like, you know what? Why wasn't there an open sharing time at the service? So I decided next July when we have our next Kneebone family reunion, which I usually miss half the time, I'm going to go. We can have an open sharing time right at the park under the shelter. Let's talk about Mark. Who has a memory about him that we can share? And that's going to bless his parents. People need to be remembered because God loves people. But remember this, Jesus loves them more than any of us. And that's the mission we have, to go tell the world. So exciting, isn't it? Go. Go see feel and pray that God would raise up more and more workers. Well, it's time to go have our communion time. So I want you to, let's, let me just say a prayer and then we're going to go into communion. Lord, we thank you for today and I pray that you would help each one of us to think through our part. What do you want us to do? Where do you want us to go? Who do you want us to see and how should we feel? because we know you want to change us. In your name we pray, amen.